all praises to the greatest. There is no one like you, Hashem. And I know you don't need me to announce it to the world. We all know it already. But I just want to remind the people that you're watching. I want to remind the people that you're holy. And that you say in the Torah, be holy because I'm holy. You want us to emulate you. You want us to act like you do. You want us to do the things that you would do in this particular situation. For example, I'll give you an example. There's a guy here that lives in my building across the, the complex. I never met this guy in my life, bro. I was sleeping. This guy came to the guard gate. They wouldn't open the guard gate for him. He lives here, but his transponder wasn't working. Bro, this guy beat probably, I'm not exaggerating, bro, maybe 20 seconds straight. So I came from the balcony and I said to him, are you kidding me, yo? And he looked up at me, F you, F this. So I told him, no problem, bro, but you should know that God is watching. And that's it, and I left. But then he kept beeping and beeping and beeping. I couldn't take it, so I ran downstairs. This was during a chag. I ran downstairs, and he parked, and he was walking into the building. So I came up to him, I said, listen, and I remember how I approached him. I approached him, not with love, because I wanted to let this dude know you don't do that. No matter what beef you have with security or the building or your transponder doesn't work. They've done it to me. They've done it to me. And he's talking about how they tow everybody. That's true. Hundred, everything he said. I even told him. I said, bro, everything you're saying, I give you. Absolutely. But you know what I'm not going to give you? You're not going to go and beep. And that everybody that lives in this complex is going to suffer. That's not going to happen. You know why? Because it's not good for you. I even made him understand that I'm caring for him. I go, yeah, you woke me up from my sleep and I understand that. And that's between me and you and God. And I get that. But for you, I'm saying, for you, it's better for you. I said, God is watching. You getting revenge. I told him, I said, the Chinese say it good. You're going to get revenge, dig two graves. One for the guy you're going to kill and one for you. He liked that. That woke him up. You see, it was amazing, bro. When I spoke to this dude, what I was really doing was I was battling the Satan. The Satan was ready in him, possessed him. <clears throat> he was already upset, bro. This guy, there was like almost no talking to him. The only reason why he allowed me to come into his space and speak to him is because I approached him <clears throat> in such an amazing way. You know how I approached him? With stern love. I don't even know if that makes sense to you. With love. So I was like, listen, bro. Like when I approached him, I said, listen, it's no beef. I don't want to fight with you. Nothing. I'm just letting you know, bro, what you just did is wrong. And he's like, no, but you don't understand. I said, nah, I do understand. You have beef with the office, but the problem is, is that you're taking it out on them, but it's affecting so many other people. Every person here that you affected, that suffered, you're going to have to pay for that. And that's the way it goes, bro. You know, whether you like it or not, I apologize, but God is watching. It's measure for measure. <clears throat> what goes around comes around. I said, look, look how I approached you. I approached you with love, bro. Not to fight, to make peace. I just wanted to let you know that, yo, your beef with the office is affecting me. So please understand that. So the funniest thing is the conversation went really well. He definitely let me get off my chest where I wanted to get off. I told him that God is watching. I told him I know he's a nice person. I told him my boy Alan works in the office. Speak to him, he might help you. So in the end, I said, so what are you going to do next time you come? Are you going to get out and hit the intercom and be patient? He goes, no. <laughs> he goes, I'm going to get an air horn and I'm going to blow it for an hour if I have to. But they're going to open up the dag gate. I didn't want to say damn. They're going to open up the gate. I was like, bro, are you kidding me? He goes, no, that's it. They're going to learn. So I said, this whole speech I gave you didn't work? He goes, no. I go, all right, so just do me a favor. I go, when you beep the horn or you blow the air horn, just think about me. So he smiled and laughed. He put out his hand. Oh, I gave him a pound, the hug, and I went back upstairs. That's a true story. Now, I'm going to tell you a couple of reasons why it worked out like this. In the end, did I get what I want? Probably not. But you know what? A couple of days passed. I haven't heard him beep, so maybe he got in touch with my boy in the office and fixed everything. I'm not really sure, but Joe, the bottom boy. line is when I came downstairs, it was a hug. Like I told you, so I think I was coming down the stairs. I was coming down the stairs. I was contemplating, you know, if I should even confront this guy, because usually I would never. I already know I'm smart enough to know. Mind your business. Be quiet. God will deal with it. But sometimes, once in a while, you just, I don't know, a situation comes where Hashem sets it up where you have an opportunity to say something. So, and this opportunity, I ran downstairs, and while I was running downstairs, I said to God, please let this go smooth. 
And I said it's coming from the heart. I'm going to approach him with love, but stern. And we'll see how it goes. And that's exactly what happened. I approached him with love, but stern. Let him know how I felt. He let me know how he felt. We shook hands like men, and we went our way. And that's how you have to be in life, bro. It's such a beautiful lesson. Because God in the Torah, you know what he says? Pursue peace. That's what he says. And I'm going to give you a beautiful lesson about pursuing peace. The Cherubim, they were like these two idols of angels, like baby angels. And when the Jews used to get along, they used to face each other. And when the Jews didn't, they used to turn their face from each other. But when the Romans broke into the second temple and destroyed it, they pulled back the curtain. They saw the Cherubim hugging. They were in shock because they see these two gold baby angels. Looks almost, God forbid, like an idol. But Hashem told them to build this. He said, build this and it's going to be right above the ark. And that's exactly what they did. And amazing is that when they pulled the curtain, they saw these two cherubim hugging. The Romans were bugging. But there were some Jews there that saw it. <clears throat> they were shocked because they knew that during the time of the temple, when they were hugging, that meant that the Jews were getting along really, really well. If they were just looking at each other, fine, stop. But if they, they were hugging, the Kohen Gadol, this is what I read, that the Kohen Gadol used to open the curtain into the Holy of Holies. Nobody Jewish walked in, boy. but they would look and they would see the Cherubim hugging each other, which meant that God was very pleased with them, that his brachot were going to get answered. Very beautiful. But here, the Romans are burning the temple, so why would the Cherubim be hugging? That's the question. It's a beautiful question. The Cherubim, if anything, should be Jewish like boy. spitting, God forbid, on each other, or like running away from each other. No, Hashem made it that they were hugging. You know why? To show the Jews that if you would have been getting along like these two angels, this temple would not be burning right now. Hashem, I just want to say very clearly to all your children, you want peace in this world? Be nice to God's children and do your best to be nice to God. And the reason I said it like that is I'll tell you why. Because God is much more forgiving than people. You understand? With God, you have a little bit of a leeway. With people, not so much. So that's why I said it like that. So the Cherubim were hugging to show the Jews that if you would have been getting along, this would never have happened. You should know that if you want to protect yourself against heat, you dip bread in vinegar. Just letting you know what the Gemara says. Ruvain said, let us go and throw him in the pit. This is in Genesis 37, 22. His intention was to save Yosef from death. Although his intention was flawed, he still got credit that he tried to save him. Although not as much credit as he would have gotten as if he would have brought him back to his father. However, we see right before that in Genesis 37, 21, clearly, what does it say? <clears throat> it says, and he saved him from their hands. So Ruvain got credit like he saved him. Why? Because he did save him. If he didn't take him out of the pit, what would have happened? He would have died. Eventually, these are the kings that descended from Ruth. You have David HaMelech, Shlomo HaMelech, Asa, Yoshefat, Uziah, Yotam, Cheskiyahu, Hoshea, and Amatziah. And you know, I just want to remind everybody that everything is in God's hands. Yes, whether you're righteous oh, or not, boy. it's in your hand. I understand that, but destiny is destiny. God will put you on a certain path and you have a certain mission. You might fail that mission. You might pass that mission. But he's going to give you an opportunity to pass it the best way you can. He's always going to look and see what your Joy. potential is and then put you in a situation that's going to be beneficial to you to be good to him. I'll give you an example. If God forbid you were gay. <clears throat> you struggled with that your whole life and you didn't fix it. Now you came back again as gay, right? This is part of the test. So you come to the world gay. That's why you see little kids, three, four years old, they already like boys. How could it be? He's 10 years old. He's like flirting with boys. How could that be? That's not even natural. The answer is that's how he died in his last life. You understand? So right away you see that Hashem puts you in a situation that might be better. He's not going to put you in a situation where you're going to be a sex slave, God forbid, as somebody gay unless he was going to punish you. But if he's going to bring you back, he's going to bring you back probably with a family that's religious, that will tell you how much being gay is wrong, and you'll have a chance to get out of it. That's the beauty of God. Like I told my mother, God, he's like, you know how a kindergarten teacher, you go up to her, you'll draw a picture and you'll show it to the kindergarten teacher, and she'll be like, oh my God, what a beautiful picture. You're such a princess. She'll give like such love. Maybe the picture wasn't even good, but she'll give her the benefit of the doubt. She'll... She'll do everything to show her love. She'll serve her. 
This is exactly how Hashem is with us. Now, He's not like that if we're ungrateful. If we're ungrateful, eventually Hashem is not going to give us. You know why? I tell you why. Because if Hashem does kindness for an ungrateful person, God forbid I say it like this, but Hashem would agree with me. Just listen to me. When you do kindness for an ungrateful person, you get a sin. You know why? Because you put a stumbling block in front of my... Actually, you know what? I might be able to say this and show you how it works out. Hashem would be able... It wouldn't be a sin for Hashem. You know, that just shows the greatness of Hashem. You couldn't even say it could be a sin from Him. You know why? Because Hashem is allowed to put a stumbling block in front of the blind. You know, to prove, and you could say to me, oh, Hashem doesn't keep His own rule. What are you talking about? No, He doesn't have to keep His own rule. You know why? Because He's putting a stumbling block to test you. That's why it says, I'm testing you and your children to see where you're going to be. I'm testing you. Hashem says it clear. And you can look at it even in the prayers to be prepared for the Joy test. Boy. And Alenu, it says, to return these words to your heart. What do you mean to return? That to always remind yourself constantly that you're in a test. I like that. And I like what I said before. I'm not going to front. That was dope. I was almost about to say that Hashem would have gotten a sin because he would have put a stumbling block in front of a blind because he's going against his own rule. And even in that, and Hashem knows I had no... Malicious intention, chas v'chalila, bro. If you listen, what am I even trying to explain it to you, bro? You listen to me, you'll know who I am, bro. But who cares what you think? I care what Hashem thinks. But the bottom line is, when I was trying to even show in a situation that Hashem might go against His own rule, and that even Hashem wouldn't do it, because if Hashem would do it, it would be like a sin. No, Hashem could do it. Why? Because He's the Master. You understand? He's the Master, meaning. He's testing us. You're not allowed to test your boss to see if he's a good person. That's not your job. That's Hashem's job. So Hashem can do that. You understand? It's very deep, bro. Know your place, you know what I mean? Real talk. And my mother used to tell me, and I like this, and I'm happy I'm talking about this right now. My mother used to tell me that her mother said to her one time, because my mother used to talk a lot. So she took her to the side, and she said to her, listen, don't talk a lot. This silence is golden. It's better not to talk a lot. But not only don't talk a lot, don't talk about your shortcomings. Don't tell everybody your problem, bro. It's not a good look because people are going to use it against you. Don't expect too much from people. And I want to tell you how King David said it. He says it better than I said it. He says, don't expect too much from generous people. Meaning if you can't expect from them, don't expect from nobody. The world is a tough place to live, bro. It's hard. We all know it, bro. We all know it. Don't try to sit here and chill like one guy told his daughter. It's not all rainbows and lollipops. And he's right. It's not. Joy, boy. <laughs> you know, you have to really surround yourself with good, solid people if you want to have peace in this world. If not, you're going to have mega drama. If you're a girl and you're going to date four different guys and act loose like that and, you know, you like the attention, you're going to dress prerogative, I Joy, guarantee boy. you, you're going to suffer. Guaranteed. That might be 40 years before you do. But God will send a guy that will play with you, rob you, play with you, shame you. Come on, man. I'm telling you, bro. I know God, bro. It's like God is really what goes around, comes around, but with perfect judgment. You don't really got to say it because nobody else can do what goes around, goes around, comes around, goes around. Because when you do it, it's revenge. It's never going to be right. You're never going to know how much he deserves and how much he doesn't. You can't judge him. You don't know everything his whole past and his whole life to judge him. Nobody knows that. Only God knows that. That's why you leave the revenge for God. It's very simple. Very simple. I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. You know, I'm going to show you how evil and disgusting this world is. And this is such a beautiful proof. I was watching, I don't know what it was on CNN. They were interviewing some guy who wrote this book called Peril, Dissing Donald Trump. Making Trump look like a pig, like a slob, misquoting him, misrepresenting him. So many lies in this book. Gossip, death, everything of the Ganon, Illuminati, the devil, everything attached to this book. And you have to see how she's congratulating him on the book. And he's smiling and he loves that Trump is suffering from this. Because you know it's going to bring Trump some suffering for sure. People make fun of him. He's a human being, bro. He sees himself on TV. People laugh at him. It's not a good look for him. I don't care who you are. I don't even be the strongest person. It's going to break you down. Eventually, you have to fight back. He does, and I give him credit. But he blesses Israel. Those who bless Israel are blessed. Those who curse Israel are cursed. He blesses Israel, and you're cursing him. It's not a good look for you, bro. Trust me when I tell you, God has his back. Yes, 
Donald Trump, as filthy as he is, that sometimes he'll be rude, how he used to be with women, but he changed a lot. He still says little nicknames. I don't like it. If I met him, I would tell him that's the Satan tricking you. You don't need to call people by nicknames. Disparage them, put them down, and embarrass them in public. Don't do that. About Tamar, it says, better to be burned in a fire than to embarrass somebody in public. We know that with Yehuda and Tamar. You should know that. And I'm going to tell you some beautiful things about Ruth and Tamar that are connected how they Tamar had to dress like a prostitute to be with Judah she had to make a plan that's how it had to go down Ruth also not like a prostitute she came more modest but she came into the bed with him onto the fleshing floor with him they were different things they both are going to be descendants of the Judah Perez and she's going to have Obed who's going to eventually have Ishai who's going to eventually have King David and you should know that Eglon is the grandson of Balak they're all connected it's crazy Bilam who was it? Balaam and Mordechai were like t- t- talking. I don't know. No, Haman and Mordechai were talking. There was something with Bilam and Balak. It's all connected. Trust me when I tell you, bro. It's all connected. It's so deep. I told somebody the other day, it's like a puzzle. You have the most humongous puzzle you've ever seen in your life. And every piece just keeps falling in. Another piece and another piece. And as the pieces are falling in, <clears throat> you're starting to see a picture. And then there's more pieces come in. That picture within another picture. Reminds me of dreams, how a dream is real in the morning, repeated right before you get up, but it's repeated a few times. You'll know in your heart, you'll feel it. And if you have a dream within a dream, or a dream where you decipher a dream in a dream, it's very deep. But regular dreams you might have in the middle of the night while you're in REM sleep are not something you should take so seriously. And there's some little connections here or there, but... When God wants to talk to you, let me put it to you like this. I'm going to tell you exactly how Hashem would want me to say it. I would think perfectly like this. If God really wants you to know something or have a sign, He'll know exactly how to give you the sign because He never wants you to have a claim and say, but Hashem, you didn't give me a sign, you didn't let me know. Nah, He'll let you know. He'll let you know. Things will happen and you'll know. It's the way it goes. Everybody knows it, bro. It might be delayed. Eventually, if he wants you in a certain place, you're going to end up in that place, bro. That's just the way it's going to be. So she's giving him compliments. Oh, you're the most amazing. Oh, this this guy's going straight to Gandalf. And you're going to go to Gandalf because you're praising the wicked. So you're both going to go to Gandalf. Sick. You should know that in Moab, that's where Ammon and Amalek lived and the Moabites lived. Moab. There was a place where when the boss got mad, he would have to put money in a jar. I like that. That's a dope boss. See, that boss I would respect. That's a humble boss. You know why? Because if that boss is putting money in the jar when he yells, it means he respects his uh, employees and and he feels comfortable to expose himself in front of his employees. And that's not showing somebody a shortcoming. The opposite. That's showing somebody that you're humble. That's showing somebody that you're righteous. That's allowed. Why? Because you bring honor to God's name. You should know that. When you act righteous and people see it and you don't do it for your honor but for the honor of God, that's bringing honor to God's name. And when you bring honor to God's name, you inspire his children to get closer to him. Absolutely. Absolutely. Go on... I don't even want to say Facebook, bro. Salik. <laughs> Fake book, I like to call it. But go take a poll. I don't even care. Even amongst the dirtiest people that don't have such good morals. And they'll tell you. They know what righteousness is. They know what humbleness is. And they would be impressed. Because they would know how hard it is to walk away from a fight. Go ask a gangster who's always getting into fights. Because everything people say to him, he goes crazy and he wants to kill somebody. Go ask him and show him how somebody will disrespect you and you'll walk away. He'll be in shock. How could it be? He couldn't even fathom in his mind that he could get to a place where he could walk away and he'd have to admit mentally you're stronger than him. Yeah, physically he might be stronger, but mentally you're stronger. You know why? Because you use your intelligence and your trust in God to show the bully who's in charge. You understand? And it's not even about who's in charge. That you're in charge. You're not. Why? Because you beat the bully because he dissed you and you didn't laugh. And you didn't cry. So, no, he didn't laugh. And he cried and you laughed. Nah, that's how it goes. It's that you brought honor to God's name by showing the bully I trust in Hashem. That's why I wrote a book called I Wish I Was a Nerd. You should really buy this book. It's an amazing book. 
And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that in the honor of God's name because this is bringing honor to God's name. It's teaching children that get bullied and they're nerds and they get bullied because they're a nerd to know that God loves nerds, to know that God loves them because they're humble, they're kind, they're righteous, they don't gossip, they're they're loving, they respect their mother and father, they're extremely intelligent, bro, they can help you so much. If you had a best friend that was a nerd, you have a problem with your computer, he'll fix it, you have a problem with this, he'll fix it, you need help around the house with handy stuff with his hands, he'll fix it, how? Because he's super duper intelligent. You need a book report, dude. You don't want to read the book. He'll read it for you. <laughs> I shouldn't even use that as an example, but not on a test. I don't know you're interested in a book, but you're too lazy to read it. You're too busy. He'll read the book for you and he'll break it down for you in cliff notes that will be so easily understood. Why? Because he's a genius. So the nerds, God loves nerds. You understand? As long as they use their intelligence to bring good to the world, God is in love with nerds. I said, next time they call you a nerd, say thank you. And I guarantee you they'll stop. And they did. And you should know that Manasseh was the son of the righteous king, Chizkiyahu. Ay, ay, ay. And somebody would say, you know, that's so big deal. So big deal. The king of Zosha was Chizkiyahu. Oh, like we care. Oh, who cares? The Torah really cares that Manasseh was like, who cares? Why do they, who cares? Why are you even talking about it? I tell you why. Because even just teaching you that Menashe was the son of the righteous king Cheskiyahu, it's already connecting you to Hashem. That's it, I didn't tell you who Cheskiyahu was, that we had a sword and everybody was nervous, so everyone got closer to God because he said whoever doesn't study Torah, he'll kill them, and he was threatening them, and he put a sword in front of the base of Midrash. I did the whole story, but I'm not even telling you that. And Menashe, we did this, and he put idols into the temple courtyard, and he did this sin, and he did that sin, and he caused people to sin, and he was Mahdi Arabim not getting into any of it. I'm just telling you, Manasseh was the son of the righteous king, Chazkiyahu. That's it. For that, you are already connected to God. Think about that. That's deep. That's deep. And you know, it's also deep that God sustains the world with pleasantness, kindness, and mercy. And you say, ooh, that's so deep. You should know that already. You know why? Because you say it in Berchat HaMazon, Bechen, Bechesed, Uberachamin. Love that God sustains the world with pleasantness, meaning He'll serve you, and He's happy to serve you. You know, like on like on a really like on a first kite, first excuse me, first class flight, how the stewardess is gonna serve you. She brings you the drink with a smile, and are you okay, Mister This, and okay, this Mister X, and what can we do for you? And is this and this and anything you need right away? She's gonna do it. That's how Hashem is with his children, with play, with a smile. Betuv levav. That's why when the Jews were keeping the mitzvot, not betuv levav, doing it just to do it, going through the motions, it wasn't even real anymore. Hashem was already disgusted with it, keeping Shabbat barely. Hashem said, you know, listen, you didn't serve me betuv levav. You know why? You know why I'm going to punish you now? But we kept Shabbat, I don't care. You didn't keep it with love. You didn't do it betuv levav. It wasn't worth anything to me. Because when I serve you, I do it betuv levav. It's in Berchat Amazon with pleasantness, with kindness. You know what's chesed? Chesed, you don't expect anything back. And you're going to tell me, oh, what do you mean? Hashem expects something back. We have to keep the Shabbat. We have to do this. What kind of a God is this? Like this guy the other day told me, Dashel, such a nice dude. And he wasn't even being disrespectful to Hashem. He meant it like he was crying out. What kind of a God is this? He needs praises. That's not a He has an ego. He's contradicting his message. I said to him, you don't understand. When God is praising himself, it's for you. It's for you to know that if you don't give him the proper respect and accord him the proper attention and focus and respect, that it's going to be a problem for you. So while Hashem is complimenting himself, and he's not even complimenting himself, he's telling us to compliment him. Because by us complimenting, we get to know who he is. And I don't understand, what's wrong with complimenting somebody that gives you life? That's a problem. That's a problem. He's not allowed to ask for some respect. He gave you life. He gave you parents. He gave you food. He gave you shelter. He gave you beautiful eyes. And even if you don't have beautiful eyes, he still gave you life. And I'm sure he gave you other things because God is always balancing it out. So what's the problem if he says, you should respect me? I don't see the problem with that. So I told Dashel, I said, chill out, bro. 
You're disrespecting God when you talk like that. Oh, no, he needs to be praised. He doesn't need to be praised. He doesn't need you to be praised. There's a billion angels that will praise him anytime he wants. As his son, he just wants you to respect him. So he has to remind you. You know why? Because you're so sucked into this material, temporal, disgusting, filthy world that you're so busy with your eyes sinning. I didn't even like that, but I'm going to keep it. You know why? Because it's so important what I just said. Do not follow after your heart so your eyes do not go astray. The sin starts from the heart. That's why God says, I want you to purify your heart. To go astray like a prostitute, like a dog. And that's 100% true because any man will tell you, once you allow your eyes to be seduced by the beauty of a woman, you can go into problems. You can have sins. You can have sins. A simple thing like meeting a woman with a low-cut dress showing her cleavage and you get even a half second excited and you catch yourself, no problem. It's still a sin for you and for her. For her, it's a bigger sin because she's putting the stomach block in front of the blind. For you, it's a sin you shouldn't have been looking at. You understand? But bottom line is it promotes sin. Stay away from immodesty. I'll tell you the story about Solika. Beautiful, beautiful Jewish girl from Morocco. The prince had his eye on her. He came to his father, the king. He said, I want to marry this girl. They approached her. They approached the family. They said, listen, the wedding's next next month. Whether you like it or not, she's going to convert to Islam. And my son is going to marry her. They said, I don't think so. And she also said, I don't think so, bro. What do you think? You're just going to make me leave my God? I don't think so. They said, if you don't marry him, we're going to kill you. She said, kill me. I'm not afraid of you. They took her. They tied her to the back of a horse, bro. They told the horse to go in circles on the floor. Glass, rocks. This is a long, long time ago. It wasn't today like a nice paved floor, like a nice tar that they used to flatten out and make it look all nice. As she's going around, her head is hitting her this. She's all scraped up. She's bleeding. She looks like she's half dead. All of a sudden, she lifts her hand down and she yells, Stop! So the king and the son get excited. They run over and they tell the horse to stop. They come next to her. Oh, you give in? You give in? She goes, no, what well, give in? Get me a safety pin. They said, a safety pin? They asked somebody from the audience, okay, give me a safety oh, pin. They gave her a safety pin. You know what she did? She took the safety pin, took it into her skirt because her skirt got ripped and it was lifted up, so it was immodest. So she took the safety pin into her skirt, into her skin, with the safety pin. No, she was not giving in. She put the skin, the safety pin into the skirt, into the skin, closed it, and looked at both of them and said, kill me. And they told the horse to go and went and she died. And you know what the most amazing thing about that story is? And it teaches us so much about modesty, about respecting God, having conviction in your religion. When you know you have the word of God, you have to be ready to die Lo Aleinu, that we should go through that test. That's a very hard test for people. But you should know that you should be ready to die for the name of God, bro. Because it's that real. He's that dope. He's that official. He's that great. He's the only one I could think that you would give your life for. You might give your life for your mother. Beautiful. But for Hashem, like that, guaranteed, you have to get to that level very hard. Very hard to get to that level. And few reached it. Very few. But you keep studying, you keep getting to know him, and you know that he runs the show. When you know he runs the show, really, the bottom line is you're going to know that. That's it, bottom line. If he needs you to give your life for him, then you're going to do it because he's running the show. Sounds very simple, but it's not. Very complicated. Very hard to get to that level. You have to go through test after test. You have to be refined. You have to be purified, just like the Jews were in Egypt. That's what Hashem did to the Jews in Egypt. You have to purify them. You know that? That's exactly what I had to do, just like gold. 
and fire, how fire purifies gold, makes it glow. Same thing over here. That's what Hashem had to do to the Jews. He did the same thing to the Jews in the Holocaust. Punishment for sins. The sins cause suffering. The suffering cleans the sins. It's just like a, it's like an equation. <laughs> it's like a baked into the cake rule of life. Joy, boy. <clears throat> There's sometimes it says that God gives the righteous suffering to double the reward. But I can't imagine when he would do that. But I'm sure if that's what it says, he does that. And he does it in a way that would be so fair that even if you were the one suffering, you would give him a hug and say thank you for that. So that just shows the beauty of God that even when he does some things that sound like, ah, how can it be done? He does it. And don't worry about it. It'll be justice. And in the end, everything will be good. That's so true, man. Man, that is really... I remember I used to say, what are you talking about? Now you can give me a billion scenarios and I can show you how it could be good. You could come and say to me, a person lost all his children. He was murdered. He was blinded. He was dead. That's all suffering. God is going to show you all the sins he did. Now you see all the suffering he got. He's in heaven chilling. <laughs> it sounds so crazy, but it's so true. Suffering cleans the sins. Remember that. Well, I just want everybody... To know that, understand that, embrace that, and know that it never has to ever, ever, ever get to that point. You can avoid this suffering by cleaning it right away. This is a beautiful analogy, Hashem, and I appreciate that you put this in my brain. This just shows you how dope the brain is. When you have a stain on a clo- on a on clothing, right? I don't know, ketchup, whatever. If you wash it right away, does the stain set? No, it doesn't. It's easy to clean. But if you forget about it and leave it, it's going to sit and it's going to set in and it's going to stain bad. And you're going to rub it and you're going to put lemon with baking soda and distilled white vinegar and you're going to put hydrogen peroxide and toothpaste and dawn dishwater. Nothing is going to take out the stain. You know why? Maybe bleach. And then it'll take it out. Bottom line is, same thing with chuba. You do a sin right away. Confess. Right away say you're sorry. You know why? Because then the sin won't set in. Think about it, bro. This is good advice I'm giving you, bro. Very good advice I'm giving you. And you should know. When you give charity to the poor, you get the better of the deal. You know why? Because that person gets money. You get the blessing of God. Because God will bless you for giving charities to his children. It will save you from death. Think about it. That's what it says. Staka chuva. Joy boy. chuva and tfila will save you from death. <laughs> A convert must wait three months to marry. You should know that. And you know it's amazing, Mashiach. It's amazing how Mashiach came. But one thing you should know is that the Mashiach, the bottom line, I don't care what anybody wants to tell you, came from Lot. That's the bottom line. Mashiach actually came. Its beginning was when Lot was with his two daughters and bred Ammon and Moab. That's 100% true. Jacob produced 12 tribes by marrying two sisters, which the Torah forbids. Judah had an unconventional tryst with Tamar, and Ruth went to Boaz on the threshing floor. This will show you exactly how Hashem works in mysterious ways. Think about this. You have Lot was with his two daughters. Then you have Jacob married two sisters, which technically wasn't allowed. It was before the Torah, so it was allowed. But just tech, if you want to get technical, look at how Hashem did it like two sins. It's crazy. This is how Hashem brought the Mashiach to Averot or to potential things. Maas Ayin. What about Maat Ayin, Hashem? No, Hashem is telling you, don't you get the picture? I'm making it happen in the most strangest way to show you that I run the show. Think, listen, let's just think. The Mashiach was the holiest. Look from who he came. He came from Jacob who married his two sisters. He came from Lod who had relations with his two daughters. He came from Judah who had an unconventional tryst with Tamar. What a nice way to say it. She dressed up as a prostitute and he was with her. And she did it for the sake of heaven. Absolutely. We would never doubt her. Absolutely not. And I'll tell you something beautiful Jewish right now. I'm so boy. amazing that Hashem would remind me of this. But there was a time where there was this big rabbi and he gave a speech almost mocking or saying that the daughters of Lot made a sin. They got him drunk. They knew what was going on. They they, uh, they maybe got pleasure from it. They came to him in a dream. Yo, they went Jewish nuts on him. Boy. They said, first of all, use your brain. 
If we did it just for satisfaction and pleasure, we're going to have children? No, we had children because we felt the world was ending and we had to continue our race. We did it for the sake of heaven. Shame on you, yo. They gave this rabbi such a speech, I bet you he didn't go to sleep for the next year. I'm exaggerating, obviously. It's a hyperbolic statement, but just to show you, you don't want to play with the righteousness, especially of a woman. That you don't want to play with. If you're a righteous woman and an evil guy comes to rob you, I would actually have mercy on the evil guy. I like that. I like that a lot, yo. That's beautiful. It just shows Hashem is so with the righteous, bro. He'll protect you. He'll protect you, yo, Hashem, yo. I just want to tell the world that when you do for God, you're going to get the ultimate blessing, which is peace. When you don't, He's going to mess your life up. He's going to trip you up. He's going to wake you up. He's going to poke you. He's going to push you. He's going to shove you. He's going to yell at you. He's going to scream to you. He's going to beg you. He's going to plead with you. He's going to come. He's going to ring your doorbell. Please, please, please open up so I can come in and talk to you. Please, I need to speak to you. And you're going to keep pressing ignore, ignore, ignore. No, Hashem, I'm not ready. I'll come to you another day. <laughs> That's not how it works, bro. That's what he's going to tell you, but you're still going to ignore him. So he's going to trip you up. He's going to say, no problem. You don't want to come back to me. I'm going to make you come back to me. I'm going to give you drama that you're going to come pray to me. And then we're going to see. Why go through all this drama? Just be nice to him from the get-go. And he'll be super duper nice to you. And everything is going to work out. I like this. It says that Ruth told Naomi that she's going to do all she asks her to do. That's what she says. It says that Ruth did according to all Naomi told her to do. And in that it's sentence, it uses the word Bekol. And in the word Bekol, it's spelled with a chaf. You know why? Because the chaf is in the shape of a semicircle. Hinting that her descendants would be sitting on the Sanhedrin, which is in the shape, which is in the shape Joy of a semicircle. Boy. I like this. Psalms 119, 62. At midnight I rose to thank you for your statutes of righteousness. I like that. It says that God enters the Garden of Eden with the righteous at midnight. And I'm going to show you three proofs in the Torah where it says only three times in the scriptures and it came to pass at midnight number one Exodus 12 29 and it came to pass at midnight that the Lord smote every firstborn in Egypt number two Judges 16 3 and it came to pass at midnight that the man was startled and turned about number three and it came to pass at midnight that the man was startled turned about and behold a woman was laying by his feet. That's the book of Ruth 3.8. And I want to just make a side note right here quick. The second one, which was in Judges, I believe 16.3. Yes. I don't know who it was talking about because it said it came to pass at midnight that the man was startled and turned about. It could be that it was talking about the story of Ruth in the book of Judges or it could be somebody separate. So we'll just have to make a side note. But those are the three times in scriptures that it wrote and it came to pass at midnight. You know why? Because all those three things occurred on the midnight of Pesach. That's dope. That's dope. And also at midnight has the same numerical value as Katz, the end, or Ketz. I'm not sure if it's Ketz or Katz. I'm not sure it's Katz. And has the same numerical value, 190, to teach that the final redemption, meaning the end, will be at midnight of Passover. That's deep. Super deep what I just read you. Now, I'm going to break something down that's dope. Because you hear some people say, oh, it could come in Sukkot. And some people say, it will come in Nisan, some people say in Sukkot, some people say come in Pesach. It could be both. It's not a contradiction. It could, the war could start here and it could end there. So let's not get it twisted. Everything in the end, I told you, falls into place like a puzzle. Everything. It's beautiful. Just like you should know. The gathering of the exiles first, then the war of Magog. That's where they're going to come to Jerusalem and go nuts. So first there's going to be a time where you're going to have, I think Mashiach ben Yosef is going to come, inspire the people. They're going to like come back to Yushalayim. Everything's going to work out beautifully. And then the nations are going to attack. He's going to die in the war. And Mashiach is going to take over. And that's going to be the end of that. And when Hashem comes on that day, neither will there be light or neither will there be night. On that day, when Hashem comes, everybody will know that God is one and His name is one. And God chose Ruth to be the grandmother of King David. You know why? 
because she did extreme acts of kindness. She took care of her mother-in-law. She gave her love. She didn't ask for any compensations for her ma- marriage contract, knowing that Naomi was poor. And she wanted to continue the name of her dead husband. That was another mitzvah. And she came to the word of God with a pure heart. That's another mitzvah. She's called the woman of valor. And the word valor in Hebrew has the numerical value of 48, hinting at the fact that it mentions to be nice to the converts and respect them 48 times in the Torah. That's dope. Elimelech was the uncle of Boaz. King David was described as skillful in praying, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent and righteous in his affairs, and calmly of appearance, and the Lord was with him. The first book of Shmuel, 1618. Job, Job, 2228. Boaz had attained the degree of the most righteous, whom the scripture says you will decree and it will be established for you. I just want to say, I want to bless every single Jewish woman and convert. I shouldn't say convert because they're already Jewish. And just say with love that I love you for this. The women did not participate in the golden calf or in the sins of the spies. Wrap your head around that. Because the sin of the spies killed the whole generation in the desert. The golden calf killed 3,000. And to this day, Hashem is still forgiving us for that sin. Slowly, slowly, and the women did not participate in that. I right now want to say to every Jewish woman out there that I respect you, that I respect the woman. This impresses me big time. I don't care. The guys can say, oh, we're the guys. Oh, we pray. They can't say Kaddish. They can't do this. And you're right. They can't. They can't touch the Torah because they can be impure from bleeding. You're right. Everything you're right. But you should always know that the woman did not, the women did not, participate in the golden calf or in the sins of the spies. God bless those neshamot. May my wife be one of those neshamot. Amen. Amen. And you should know that Eglon was the son of Balak or the grandson. I don't know. Maybe there's two different opinions. I think I might have earlier said the grandson. So if there's two opinions, I would go by the grandson. Hashem, I love you. This video came out so good. I'm so happy with it. Chuck full of knowledge. You know what I mean? Just a lot of wisdom and knowledge. Again, not me. Not me. Yo, you could say, yo, you gave a great speech. You could get up and give me a standing ovation. You could whistle. Say, wow, you inspired me. All of it. Thank you. And I'll be appreciative for that compliment. I promise you. But you should know that it's the word of God that I'm promoting. And that's what you're attracted to. That's all you're attracted it's, it's like, you know what it's like? If you got a gift with beautiful gift wrapping, you know, like gorgeous gift wrapping with a beautiful message and a picture of you and your mom when you were kids. I don't know what to tell you, bro. I'm just a rapper, bro. That's it. I like that. Because really, in real life, I'm also a rapper. <laughs> That's dope. I like that. Akadosh Baruch Hu, I love you. Akadosh Baruch Hu, I beyond respect you. Akadosh Baruch Hu. There is no one like you. And I always end my talks. Always. And forever, God willing. With I love you, Hashem. Because I really do.